the last virology lecture? That was being negative, right? <laughs> uh, speaking of virology lectures, I just got a link to the PowerPoint slides of Dr. Waiters' lecture from last time, so I will be posting those as soon as I get back to my office. Uh, office hours are going to be a little short today because if you want to hear about the fifth grade version of All About Viruses, come to Mary Hayhurst School at 12.15 this afternoon, <laughs> room 26. So um, I'll be talking about really little stuff. And no, I won't be telling them what's on the exam, sorry. Um, which is when? And all of you filled out your course evaluations? Yes. All of you are coming to graduation? Yes. Good. All, all very good answers. I like those. Um, hopefully the answers to the clicker questions, I'm going to like those just as much as well. So our last four clicker questions of the term. Oh. Sad. And so <clears throat> the genomes of most archaeal viruses are single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, positive strand, single-stranded RNA, negative strand, or retroviruses. Pardon? <laughs> Why? How? <laughs> Where on earth would you get that idea from? people here today. Good turnout. Must be because they're extra clicker questions. Or because people don't like the sun. That must be it. Yeah. Nobody likes the sun. Does anybody else want to vote? No? Are we done? No, nope. well, we got another one. Oh, we got one more. Hopefully that was a vote being dropped on the floor. <laughs> Eight, seven, six. So what do we think? Double-stranded DNA, yes, most of them are. Um, we didn't talk about them. There are a few single-stranded DNA viruses in Archaea. Not very many, although one of the ones I didn't talk about is the largest single-stranded DNA virus ever found, which is found in Archaea, which is pretty cool. Uh, single strand RNA virus, uh, positive strand. There's one report in the literature by my ex postdoctoral advisor. I don't believe it. Um, and then no reports so far of retroviruses or the um, negative strand, I'm oh, sorry, retroviruses of negative or positive strand for that matter. So our next clicker question, the genome of SSV1, talk about being biased, is packaged in the virion as negatively supercoiled DNA, positively supercoiled DNA, linear DNA, circular DNA, or B and D. And anybody working in my lab who gets this wrong gets minus five points. <laughs> you need a special notation when I do the air quotes. <laughs> Four, three, two, one. 
Lift off. We have, oh, let's show the results. Show the results. There we go. Um, and one of the great things I can see how people vote and they, here, they all started out here and then they all jumped down to here, uh, <laughs> which is a great practice for reading all the answers to the questions on an exam when Stedman writes them. Um, so yes, it is, it is B and D um, down here. They are <coughs> both of those, which again, if you combine these two, that gets you to this one. Um, so E it is. And our next clicker question, which has nothing to do with archaeal viruses, sorry, um, is Hantan viruses were originally found in Korea, India, Portland, Africa, South America. Um, the Hantan River is in Korea. Um, what about India? Why would I put India up here? What, would the question be if the answer were to be India? Let's do the Jeopardy approach. <laughs> Cholera, no. Um, first Hantan virus found in a non-rodent was in India. Portland, there's something about that on the next Flickr slide, so we won't talk about those. Um, Africa. They didn't think there were any, but it turns out there are a whole bunch that are similar to these non-rodent-like Hantan viruses, which are there. South America, that's how they figured out that the dentist was having an affair. So, <clears throat> select our answer. Yes. Show our results. So, the last clicker question of the term. In Portland, hantavirus antibody prevalence in mice is inversely proportional to amount of urine, number of mice, biodiversity, number of rats, rainfall. Not always easy to come up with five choices. Time to start guessing. Five. So, what do people think? No idea? That's not quite what the answers are, are looking at here. So, antibody prevalence means what? 
No. Basically, how many animals have been exposed to the virus? Not necessarily those that, in fact, have the virus. Um, inversely proportional to, you know, high is going to be one, low is going to be the other, right? So, um, amount of urine? No, nobody likes that. Number of mice? If anything, high numbers of mice are going to be high amounts of virus prevalence. So it would be the direct proportional rather than inverse proportion. Um, number of rats, rainfall. Um, there's a really cool rainfall story that Dr. Reyes didn't get a chance to talk about, um, but it is biodiversity, yes. Sayonara, see you Tuesday. <clears throat> so now's the part of lecture where I talk really fast for the next 50 minutes or 40 minutes, um, as the case may be. So this, as usual, for my reviews, is nothing new. This is all stuff that I've talked about before and or figured that I didn't do a terribly good job explaining the first time around. What I don't have here is a review of Dr. Oedis' lecture. So that is, again, I, I'll try and throw together those slides and, and at least post them online. Um, if you have any questions about that or any of the other lectures, please feel free to you know, bug me now. Um, or also send me emails. Uh, I'll be checking those all the way until probably you know, 7.59 on Tuesday morning. Whether I get around to answering them is a different story. But certainly Monday night I'll get you an answer to those things. So we started out after the last midterm talking about retroviruses. And this is the classic retrovirus. This is true for basically all of them, not just for HIV. And we'll talk about some of the HIV differences in just a second. Uh, these all are basically messenger RNAs that get packaged in their genome. Of course, there are two of them that are packaged there. We'll take a look at replication in just a second. But what's important from this slide is what's encoded in those genomes. It's basically two polyproteins, either GAG-POL, which are the group-specific antigens. Again, horrible name. But these are the main structural proteins, matrix capsid, nucleocapsid. They're the wrong way around here, um, followed by the enzymatic proteins, protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase. Differential splicing that happens from here to here leads to the other polyprotein, which is surface and transmembrane protein. And so that's what you have in all retrovirus genomes. You always have GAG-POL and envelope. And in some ways, you can think about these Paul genes also as being structural proteins, because of course they're in the virion. They have to be in the virion. If they're not in the virion, then there's no way that the retrovirus can undergo its replication. Just GAG is group-specific antigen. Horrible name. Um, but they're the main structural proteins that make up the, the nucleocapsid. So matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid are those GAG proteins. There are some other ones in some of the other viruses, but ignore that I said that as far as the exam is concerned. So how these guys replicate, they interact, again, not surprisingly, through their surface transmembrane proteins here with the outer membrane of the cell. That envelope fuses. You release the capsid. In the nucleocapsid, you've got two copies of the genome, all the enzymes, the protease, the reverse transcriptase, and the integrase. The reverse transcriptase does its job, and we'll see that on the next slide, makes a double-stranded copy of this RNA genome. That gets transported into the nucleus. With a lot of retroviruses, you have to have cell division that takes place, break down the, cell, the nuclear membrane, because otherwise this thing's too big to get in. Lentiviruses have figured out a way to get past that. Lentiviruses like HIV. They don't need cell division. Here, once you get inside, then the integrase protein, again, that last of the three enzymes here, integrates the double-stranded DNA into the genome. And now you have this provirus in the genome that can get transcribed either as your full polyprotein or then the envelope proteins. 
which are then all put together out here at the end. Your virus particle is released, and then you have the activity of the protease. The protease activity is only really right here at the end, where you have that final proteolytic activity, which leads to the structure, the final structure of the virus. It's a little hard to see here in this process. You go from a much more amorphous to a complete capsid, which is present here. So that's the process in general of retrovirus replication. The really fascinating aspect, at least from a molecular biology point of view, is how you go from RNA to DNA. And so that has to do with, of course, the reverse transcriptase and how it gets from RNA to DNA. You start out with a cellular TNA, tRNA primer, which is very close to the 5' prime end of the genome. That then serves as the primer for reverse transcriptase. Template is just the genomic DNA makes a copy of this end of the genome, which has a repeated sequence and a unique sequence, which is present at the five prime end. The yeah, little quotes here, not air quotes, um, this has to do with it's a complement of those sequences. Since it's a complement of this repeated sequence at this end of the genome, it can also base pair over here at this end of the genome, which provides you with a primer. Your genome is a template you can replicate your way all the way down to the other end of the genome. Then you have RNase H activity, RNase which cleaves up hybrids between DNA and RNA. You then have a small piece of RNA that's left, this PPT, which serves as a primer for your second strand, which extends out through the primer sequence in your tRNA gives you a copy of your primer binding site, which is now complementary to the primer binding site that you have over the end. This has a second strand exchange. The first strand exchange was this one right here, going from this end to that end. Here, this end back over to this end. And again, all browns are DNAs. Here, that provides a primer with the template of the DNA which has already been made. And on the opposite strand, you have a primer with the template of this piece which has just been shifted from the other end. What that generates is your proviral DNA, which is now a repeated sequence at each end. So U3RU5, U3RU5, present at both ends of the genome, and that's what gets integrated. So if you look at one of these retroviruses, proviruses in the genome, you'll always see that it's got these repeated sequences at both ends. How do those get in? I think I didn't do a very good job talking about integration last time. These are the activity of the integrase gene, which will bind to these repeated sequences at both ends of the genome. So you end up with basically a circular piece that chews off a couple of nucleotides at each end, giving you some slight overlaps here. Then it binds to and cuts pretty randomly in the genome. When I say pretty randomly, again, we could have the randomly in quotes here, uh, mostly because this depends on the structure of the genome much more than a sequence. So if you're heterochromatin, everything's really compacted. You're not going to have much integration there. If you have euchromatin, which is actively being transcribed, you're going to have a lot more integration that's happening in that part of the genome. So here, cuts ligates, then you have a little gap, which is formed because it doesn't cut right across from one strand relative to the other. That gap then gets filled in by the cellular DNA polymerase, giving you a direct repeat just outside of the inverted repeats that you have in your genome, which is your LTR. Sorry, no, direct repeat. So it's direct repeat, direct repeat. So it's a cellular direct repeat. Back up, rewind. Uh, U3RU5, U3RU5, of course, is a direct repeat. It's been flipped around to be an inverted repeat. So we've got the direct repeat, which is due to the viral genome. What's that called, by the way? Long terminal repeat, LTR, exactly. So LTRs, which are internal to the provirus, and then this direct repeat sequence, which comes from the genome which was cut by the integrase gene when it's going in. 
the questions on the general retroviruses integration, et cetera. Couple of interesting differences that you have with HIV-1. How many people made it to the lecture yesterday? That was really cool. Um, CMB and also talking about HIV. Uh, most of what they're using for their HIV vaccines that are going to be going on, going on trial, being used in a clinical trial uh, later next year are using the GAG proteins, so the main structural proteins. Big difference with HIV relative to these other ones are all of these extra proteins which are generated by alternative splicing down here towards the three prime end of the genome. GAG pollen end are just like what you have in all of the other proteins. TAT and REV, which are the main ones that we talked about. TAT does what? TAT stands for transactivator of transcription. It's really an anti-terminator, so it binds to the RNA and then allows the RNA polymerase to transcribe much longer than otherwise would. Normally, it's a much shorter piece. Um, Rev does what? <laughs> Haven't reviewed that yet. <laughs> it's important for nuclear transport, but nuclear transport of what? It's important for nuclear transport of the genomic RNA. Now, this normally you have nuclear transport of spliced RNAs, right? Is the genome spliced? No. So you have to have the activity of the TAT protein in order to get this full-length RNA well transported out of the nucleus. And you only make it much later on in the process of HIV replication. Okay, questions on HIV before we slip over and do some of those other kinds of viruses. Oh, well, it's a nice transition, the retroviruses from the RNA viruses to the DNA viruses. So we talked about small DNA viruses. These are the polyoma and the papilloma viruses. These have genome packaging that looks a heck of a lot like host genome packaging, which is not terribly surprising because they're almost completely dependent on the host. These have very small genomes, and mostly what their genomes encode are structural proteins, the late genes, and proteins which muss up the host, um, usually trying to convince that host to go through replication when it otherwise wouldn't, because most cells are not actively undergoing replication. So basically what most of these small DNA viruses do is <coughs> convince the host that, yeah, actually it is a good idea to replicate. Uh, but replicate, of course, the virus genome as opposed to replicating the host genome. And these guys, again, they're bound by host histones, and they're wonderful tools for understanding how transcription, translation, replication all work on nucleosome-bound templates. If you think about <clears throat> SV40, this has a nice circular genome basically makes three proteins. This one doesn't really count. The tiny T antigen varies from polyomavirus to polyomavirus. But small t, middle t, and large t antigens, all generated by differential splicing. And the real big player here is the large t antigen. These are all made from early transcripts. All of your structural proteins, surprise, surprise, are made from late transcripts. Again, this is really pretty typical, something we've talked about a um, bunch of times already here. How is that being controlled? It's mostly controlled through our friend, the large T antigen. Ever question on exam, what's doing X in SB40? The answer 90.99% of the time is going to be large T antigen uh, because it serves both as binding for the enhancer to turn on late transcription. It also is important for replication. All of these binding sites are right here, right in the middle, right between your leftward promoter and your, sorry, leftward promoter and rightward promoter, or late promoter and early promoters here. <clears throat> Again, what does the large T antigen do? Basically everything. Uh, binds to RB, 
which is critical for regulating the cell cycle. Usually RB, of course, is stopping the cell cycle, not allowing it to go further. Put in large T, that pulls off RB, gets the nucleus, original nuclear localization signal, mimics DNAJ, binds to P53, also important for regulating the cell cycle, binds to P300. P300 is important for what? Transcriptional regulation. It's a coactivator, histone acetyl transferase. Um, go. Any more questions again on the small, small DNA viruses before we shift over to some bigger ones? Okay, so adenovirus, basically fascinating for three reasons, like three slides that I'm going to show on it. <laughs> the first one of those is the structure, this amazing pseudo T equals 25 icosahedral structure, sort of the classic eukaryotic virus here, and we have really amazing high-resolution structures, well, five years ago now, well, pretty amazing, this is probably going to be in the textbook, at least the next version of it, of where we know the structure of the hexon proteins, we know the high-resolution structure of the penton proteins, plus all of these other ones which are present in here as well, and that's basically shown here. It's not critical that you know all the names here, but that we do have a high-resolution structure both from X-ray crystallography, but in this case, it's a cryo-electron microscopy structure um, where we have basically almost as good resolution in a electron <coughs> micrograph as well as X-ray crystallography. Um, so this structure, again, it's a highly complicated structure, lots of different proteins that come together to make it, and then has these nice projections. This is probably the easiest one to see right here at the five-fold axes of symmetry. What's present inside that genome? <coughs> Excuse me, double-stranded linear DNA with terminal proteins bound at the end. Why are those terminal proteins bound at the end? They're serving as primers for replication. So protein-primed replication, which we've seen also for some of the RNA viruses. Here, this is protein-primed replication <coughs> seen for DNA viruses. There, are <coughs> excuse me, probably some virus or other, probably an adenovirus. Could be a rhinovirus, we'll see. Uh, <coughs> the replication here, protein prime, you also find in some archaeal viruses as well. I forget if I mentioned that before. So this terminal protein serves as the primer. You also have these inverted repeat structures now. This really is an inverted repeat because on one strand it's CAT, CAT, CA. On the other strand here, it's CAT, CAT, CA. Um, the added T here is, of course, because there was a typo which was present in the textbook. So structure, genome, particularly with the protein prime part of it. But then, of course, the wonderful transcriptional regulation, mostly regulated at the level of splicing, particularly for all of these late proteins. And this, of course, is where splicing was originally found. You have the early proteins, which just like those other small RNA virus, sorry, DNA viruses, which we've talked about, are involved in regulating the cell cycle, convincing cells, once they're infected with adenovirus, to make all the proteins that they need. <clears throat> there are a couple of smaller proteins, but the main thing as far as all of the splicing regulation are the late proteins. One transcript, which is being started here, the major late transcript in adenovirus, all of these transcripts end up having these three sequences, the tripartite leader sequence, which then gets spliced to any one of these other RNAs here, each of which is also regulated by where the poly A tail is put on. So each of these different five classes here is where the poly A tail is. So splicing at this end, poly A tailing at that end, giving you almost all of the proteins here which make up that fabulous structure that we just looked at. Yeah. So the early proteins all have different promoters, or most of them do. Um, each of these um, vertical lines here represents one promoter, one set of transcripts that are being made. Um, and so that's, you can see here, for all of these brown ones, there's just one vertical line here. So for late, it's just that one. 
Um, the early ones have different promoters. Other questions on the adenovirus genome? No, I don't expect you to remember all of these um, names and numbers. And then there's some small RNAs that are made there as well. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, the, uh, the RNAs, um, do you need to know more information about the RNAs that are involved in cellular design? The early? So cellular regulation, but what else are they doing? Early transcripts. What do early transcripts do in all kinds of different viruses? Involved in replication. So that would be the other thing. That's these ones here. Your terminal protein. Where are we? Um, terminal protein, DNA polymerase, DNA binding protein, all of which are involved in replication. So our terminal protein, someone in office hours asked me about the, uh, the pre-terminal protein here. Um, that's just before it gets extended. So PTP is just terminal protein before it becomes extended. Um, and again, I'm not quite sure why they have this different form here, the different blob. Um, that's all coming from the same protein. It's the protein that ends up being the, called the TP again here at the other end. The way, again, that protein prime replication works is you have a modification that happens here on an OH on the terminal protein. That then is the primer. Your DNA polymerase will replicate its way down the genome. The single-stranded DNA binding protein here is really critical because that basically serves as your helicase, binding two single strands and pulling those two strands apart. So that helical activity, I say helicase activity, um, is all that you need. The single-stranded DNA binding protein is actually a really very, very good at binding to single-stranded DNA. Once you've replicated your way down to the end of the genome, these single-stranded pieces, because of the inverted terminal repeats that are present at the ends of the genome, can fold back on top of each other and basically provide the same kind of origin of replication, just like you had over here. The DNA polymerase has no idea, or the preterminal protein, that this end is any different than that end. They're basically identical as far as the polymerase and the recognition is concerned. So that's how those guys get replicated. Any more questions on the adenos? And we'll start to get a little bigger, um, talking about some of the herpes viruses. And this herpes virus, by the way, is a herpes simplex virus. So it's one of the alpha herpes viruses that Klaus Fru talked about yesterday, or basically didn't talk about yesterday. Um, these are the double-stranded DNA viruses, which basically go and hide out in neurons. Um, the couple of important things that I wanted to mention here. Um, first is this VP16 protein, um, also known as alpha-TIF, horrible name here. All of these are actually really horrible names. Uh, but this protein is present where in the virion? Tegument. Where's the tegument? It's between the membrane on the outside and the capsid on the inside. And so there are a number of proteins which are there, particularly the proteins which are important for very early steps or also the immediate early steps in <clears throat> the genome replication. Immediate early is going to be important for what? So transcription, but also regulating host, because that's the first thing you need to do. As soon as the, that comes in, you have to be regulating host genes, and in the case of the cytomegalovirus, as we, some of us heard about yesterday, um, it's also involved in regulating the immune system. So these <coughs> proteins, yeah, the alpha, alpha TIF, VP16 are present in the tegument, also have this part of the genome, S and L. These undergo recombination all the time, and that probably has to do with how these genomes are being replicated. Alpha 0 and alpha 4 are part of this repeated sequence, which is here. Alpha 0, alpha 4, anything which is alpha is going to be involved in very early transcription. So ICB0 also would be <coughs> alpha 0. Um, these are all the transcripts which are important for immediate early transcription. These are the 
proteins, which are going to lead to expression of all of the later and later genes in the herpes virus replication cycle, including some of these latent transcripts. And the latent transcripts are those which get made when, and it's still not entirely clear how this happens, the virus gets into usually the nucleus of a neuron and is just hanging out there. And that hanging out process is completely dependent on the expression of these latent transcripts. You can make mutations in these latent transcripts. If you do that, the virus is never latent. It just will replicate completely normally and not undergo this latent phase. So they're absolutely critical. They don't seem to encode anything. Um, very active area of research trying to figure out what these guys are actually doing. Another thing that I forgot to mention, was a good thing I put it on the slide here, is almost all of the herpes virus transcripts, particularly anything that's after these real immediate earlies are unspliced. And there's a certain amount of discussion about what that means. Um, there's actually a really cool paper that just came out and was discussed on This Week in Virology that said, actually, it might have to do with transcriptional termination rather than splicing in terms of regulation here. But as far as this class is concerned, it's all about splicing. <laughs> um, or I probably won't have any question on the exam, so you can just ignore that part of it. Uh, but <clears throat> Again, this is sort of repetition here. The alpha genes, these are going to be expressing your immediate early proteins. These are mostly regulated by either BP16 or cellular proteins, SP1, normal Tata box, et cetera. So these are going to be the proteins which are regulating this to start with. This particular gene is the ICP4 gene. ICP4 is one of the regulators for later transcription. In this case, it's early, the immediate early and early transcripts. Uh, so ICP4 also will regulate its own production, basically shutting down extra production of that protein that you don't need later on in virus replication. These are clearly regulated, these you know, immediate early, early, and late genes by their promoters. And they've all got slightly different promoters, <clears throat> Again, the early versus the late ones. In terms of the proteins that you might want to remember for an exam, uh, ICP4 is this major regulatory protein. It's turning on all of these early and late genes, and it's in one of the immediate early genes. Um, also shuts off expression of its own gene. ICP27 was implicated for splicing, but whether it's really critical for the reason that you've got large and small numbers of splicing intermediates, I'm not entirely sure. So um, unfortunately, I read this paper and heard the TWIV after we gave this lecture. So it's a nice example of how stuff changes really fast in virology. So any questions on the, the herpes viruses? Okay, immunization. Hopefully, I have beaten this horse over the head enough this term, but just as a reminder, um, stuff wasn't real good in the U.S. before we had vaccines, and we are so much better off with these vaccines, except for people who decide for whatever reason that they don't want to take them. Certain people cannot get vaccinated, and that's one of the really important reasons to be vaccinated, if you can be, because there are people with immune deficiencies, egg allergies, etc., who cannot be vaccinated. And so it's really critical that everyone else be vaccinated as far as that's concerned as well. So more questions on vaccines, hopefully not. No, everyone's gonna get their flu shot this coming season, or they're not gonna sit in a class like this where they're less than a meter away from other people. Good. <clears throat> so um, that was the lead in. And one of the neat things yesterday, in fact, that um, Klaus Fru talked about, which is, I think was kind of fun, is that you know, vaccinia virus, the smallpox vaccine, which is really not related to cowpox at all. Um, they've done some more studies. And it actually looks like it's more related to a horsepox virus. And so the horses infected the cows, the cows infected the milkmaids, and there the milkmaids virus was the vaccinia virus. So it had already been passaged through multiple different organisms before it got to humans, so it's not terribly surprising that it was already attenuated at that point. So <clears throat> this is, in fact, how vaccinia virus replicates because for hopefully pretty obvious reasons, very few people work with smallpox itself. 
<coughs> but they look very, very similar to each other. And apparently, at least as much of the research has been done, and not a huge amount of research has been done on the actual variola virus, seem to replicate in very similar ways. So you've got a membrane-bound virion here, either gets in directly to the plasma membrane or through receptor-mediated endocytosis, and basically has these extra proteins that are in a similar kind of place to the tegument as you have in the herpes viruses, basically underneath the membrane. When you have the fusion, the release of those enzymes, those are the ones which lead to basically everything as far as pox virus replication is concerned. These guys are double-stranded DNA viruses, but they don't need to get to the nucleus because they've got absolutely everything else that they need. They've got all their DNA polymerases. They've got RNA polymerases. They've got their <coughs> regulatory proteins for RNA polymerases. Um, everything that they need to replicate, even though they're DNA viruses, not having to deal with the nucleus at all. So they're pretty autonomous in terms of when they come in. So you have fusion, the core structure, again, not at all unlike the capsid that you have with herpes virus, although the herpes viruses have to go to the nucleus. Here, these guys don't. And that's because they encode all of these <clears throat> early transcription factors, early transcription factors, and their own RNA polymerase binds to a very specific promoter, which is not the same as your regular Tautobox promoter. Not terribly surprising here. Those early proteins, among them, are some of the intermediate transcription factors that are being expressed. You get DNA replication. After you've had DNA replication, again, all with cellular proteins, cellular, pro oh, that's not cellular proteins, all with viral proteins. Viral DNA polymerase, viral DNA primase, viral ribonucleotide reductase, viral thymidine kinase, all of these things to take everything they need to replicate from the cytoplasm. Make more of the genome. Once more the genome is made, it starts to make the transcription factors that are important for late transcription. Late transcription, just like we've talked about, hopefully again, ad nauseum now, these are all of your viral structural proteins. Viral structural proteins, which are made, start to make these sort of crescent-shaped structures, which we'll take a look at in just a second. Then you start to build the core and all of the other proteins that are next to it. You can either have a single membrane, which is put around these, or multiple membranes that get wrapped around them. And then these virus particles either get transported to the next cell because actin polymerization happens and basically shoots these guys from one cell to the other, or they're released and chucked over the wall with the trebuchet. Um, you said single membrane and double. I thought yeah. it was uh, two. Right. So you get, you get one membrane that gets put on here, this immature as a intracellular immature virus particle, and then one or two more. So it can be three. And so in the case where you release the virus particle that's got two membranes on it, inside the cell it's got three because it's that external one which is then going to fuse to the plasma membrane and release the double membrane bound form. Yeah. Yeah. And it's actin, not microfusion. It's actin. Actin polymerization that's happening. Yeah. Why two versus one? People basically hand wave about that. And so the, the membrane, particularly the single membrane around the outside, has so many proteins in it that it's actually a little hard to differentiate it as membrane sometimes. Um, so I talked to the guy who wrote this chapter, Rich Condit. Uh, I talked to him about some other stuff that we're doing in my lab. And he said, well, actually, it's not really a membrane-bound virus. It's not really enveloped because it's mostly protein. So, uh, but that's with just the, you know, these, these you know, single or the double membrane bound forms. As soon as you have a, that, you know, the single membrane bound form on the outside, that's the one which is, if I remember correctly, is pretty stable. Okay. Um, and so that's probably the one which is where you're getting the transmission of the disease from. If you look inside infected cells, 
<clears throat> this is what you see, starting out with these little crescent structures, which is just what we saw in the cartoon last time. Eventually start to build cores, that's what this arrow is about, and then eventually these mature virus particles. These are the ones which are going to pick up those either extra one or two membranes, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> before they get released from the cell. I only have to get through 15 more minutes, then I'm done with the term, right? <coughs> so the, these are the particles which again are attached to the actin tails, and this seems to be important for getting transmission from cell to cell. So the actin tails are binding to, not surprisingly, membrane proteins. And just the polymerization of the actin leads to this real membrane blebbing with the virus particle at the very end, probably important, again, from cell to cell. Virus-infected cells, as opposed to non-infected cells, really mess up the actin structure considerably. So this would be normal actin. This is in a vaccine-infected cell. Yeah? <laughs> Which comes first, vaccinia or um, the list listeria monocytogenes, which has the same kind of thing? Um, turns out there are two very different proteins that are involved in that. So in listeria, there's ACT A, um, which is important for actin polymerization, which does, again, a very similar thing to this. Um, the protein whose name I can't remember, so I don't expect you guys to remember it either, in smallpox turns out to be very different, but still serving a very similar role. So what came first, you know, chicken or the egg? really don't know. But it's fascinating that there seem to be two very different proteins that are serving exactly the same kind of mechanism. Polymerization of actin in order to move this infectious particle, be it a vaccinia virion or a listeria, from one cell to another. Really amazing. You know, biology is so cool. Evolution rocks. Um, so, or rockets is the case maybe. So, <laughs> I had to get that one in there. <laughs> You'll be so glad you won't have to listen to those anymore after today. So <clears throat> these pox viruses are one of the um, <clears throat> lar so nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. Again, horrible acronym. Um, but they are clearly related to these other giant viruses that we talked about, including the phyco DNA viruses, which are those large viruses of algae, the Mimi viruses, and if this figure were up to date, there would be a few more lines over here going to Pandora viruses and pithoviruses. So it turns out that these giant viruses, even those ones that have very, very different structures, Pandoras and pithos, have some of the same genes which are conserved through all of these different genomes. What's in the genomes? basically everything, and the kitchen sink, uh, really everything that you need in order to replicate a virus genome, and even a bunch of stuff that you seem to have to have in order to replicate and translate the virus genome. Remember one of our sort of definitions of what makes a virus a virus is that it needs the host translation machinery. Well, in this case, it needs the host ribosome. Um, because it's got almost all of the rest of the translation machinery. In the case of PBCV1, it's got a bunch of tRNAs. In the case of Mimi virus, it has amino acyl tRNA synthetases in addition to a bunch of tRNAs and, again, basically everything that it needs in order to replicate its genome um, and translate most of it as well. One of the big surprises, as well as this amazing size that you have in Mimi virus genomes is also the release mechanism, which is this Stargate structure, one specific five-fold axis of symmetry that's very different than all of the other ones and opens up in order to release the genome here into the host, and the poor host then uh, manages to get completely taken over by the virus replication. That virus factory present inside the cell 
So way back when we talked about the whole virus, the life cycle, this is a nice example of how these Mimi viruses, once they get inside the amoeba, poor thing, it thought it was food, but now you have Stargate release of the genome. That then leads to basically production of something that looks a lot like another nucleus, and that's supposed to be what's shown up here. So here's a infected amoeba cell <clears throat> stained with DNA stain. Here's the nucleus. There's the virus factory. And look, the virus factory, which is producing way more DNA, way more active than even the nucleus in this case, and in late infection, you stain with DNA stains. There's no DNA left in the nucleus whatsoever. It's all present here in the virus factory. What does that virus factory look like? Kind of hard to see electron dense wise, but all of the viral proteins, et cetera, you're forming each of these giant mimivirus particles, in this particular case, right around the virus factory. As soon as you get to, this is literally thousands of virions per cell. Now these are pretty giant virions, but you remember they're infecting amoeba, and amoeba are pretty big. So you can get literally thousands here. Um, it's a little hard to see, but even in, in differential contrast microscopy, this is now light microscopy, you can see the individual virions which are here. You can also see some of the Stargate um, processes where they are releasing their genomes right here. So any other questions on the giant viruses before we, yeah, sure. Uh, didn't they have some weird way of getting inside the cell if they didn't have a receptor there? <clears throat> oh, so how these guys get inside the cell? So what is happening, appears to be happening here is that the MIMI, of course, stands for mimic. And so, as well as mimicking a bacterium when we found them in the first place, we humans, it's probably they're doing exactly the same thing to the amoeba. So the amoeba think they're food. So they bring them up into a vacuole, which would usually what they'd be using for digestion, and then they escape from that. And that seems to be this escape through the Stargate formation, and that's basically what's shown just down here at the bottom, you know, where these green arrows are. Yeah. EHUX is not a mimi virus, but it's a giant virus. Um, you could also call it a what kind of virus? So the EHUX are algae. So it will be a phyco DNA virus. So not a mimi virus, but a phyco DNA virus. Okay, other questions on these ginormous things? See, almost as cool as our kale viruses but not quite. So these are our mostly double-stranded DNA viruses. Uh, the filamentous viruses with these cool claw-like structures at the end. My second favorite virus here, um, STIV, with these leap projections um, at the five-fold axis of symmetry. These bottle-shaped viruses, the Acidionis bottle-shaped virus is probably the most bizarre virion known to date, I think, anyway. I don't know if anyone knows of any more that are more bizarre than these. Um, and then, of course, near and most near and dear to me are these SSV viruses because we've done a ton of really cool mutations. See, we mutated the whole thing away, so it disappeared. <laughs> so it's bizarre. This worked last time, right? Why is it? Max. Must be Max. If only I used a PC, I wouldn't be able to see anything on any of those slides. So <laughs> um, we've done lots of insertions, deletions. Um, turns out that these guys have really, really flexible kinds of genomes. We can make a lot of changes to them. They still seem to be actually relatively OK. Um, one of the questions I didn't ask was what other kinds of DNA can get packaged other than SSV1 DNA, which is positively supercoiled. What's the packaging in terms of the SIRV, which is really surprising? It's A-form DNA, which is packaged here. It's the only way it seems to fit into that structure. Whether it gives you stability that way is very much an open question. The last thing, which I think is really appropriate that I wanted to talk about, had to do with the fact that you know the most ancient viruses ever are just really similar to the one that I found. Uh, but 
how we get to that conclusion has to do with the structure of each of the capsid proteins. So the major capsid protein of PRD1, which is a bacterial virus, STIV, which is an archaeal virus, adenovirus, the hexon protein that we just looked at here, these have practically identical coat protein structures, no detectable sequence similarity whatsoever. So we think this is an indication that the last common ancestor, what also people call LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, our last universal cellular ancestor, was infected probably by an icosahedral virus that probably had a coat protein structure that looked a lot like this. Now, whether it actually looked like my virus, that's somewhat speculative. Thank you for a wonderful term, and good luck on your final.